Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 601 of the podcast and it is Saturday the 29th of January 2022 as I record this. So today's show is a futurist in between episode, a discussion between my friend and co-author on lots of things, Jay Thorne, and me about NFTs and blockchain. Now, I know it takes time to get to grips with new technology, and our hope is that this conversation, amongst others, will help the pennies begin to drop for you if you're new to this. And if you do already know a bit about NFTs, or if you listen to my earlier shows on this, this might give you ideas for what your uh, author career could look like over the next decade. So Jay and I are both authors, obviously, (laughs) and we're passionate about helping writers find new ways to create, collaborate, reach fans and make more money in the creator economy. We're also both very excited and you will feel our energy in this interview about the creative and financial possibilities of emerging blockchain technology, including NFTs. So in this discussion, we cover... We try to explain NFTs for non-technical people with some metaphors that might help. We talk about why we're so excited about NFTs and the benefits to authors and other creators, as well as resale of unique digital assets using smart contracts on a blockchain and why that is such a radically new prospect for publishing and why it is so exciting for long-term creators who own and control their intellectual property. We talk about the different kinds of NFTs that authors could use, both in fiction and non-fiction, and how AI-generated art and music might even play a part in that. We also discuss fractionalisation of royalty rights and how this is emerging in the music industry, how we see unique digital originals, NFTs, sitting alongside unique physical products. And I am actually doing a book binding course uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. Jay's doing music, thinking of doing vinyl. And we talk about why we're just feeling so much more creative with this emerging technology. We also talk about some of the different blockchains and the different companies emerging in the NFT for book space and our thoughts on what we want to see in a uh, platform before we commit, uh, essentially because smart contracts represent a long term commitment. We have questions about the financial and tax implications of NFTs and we talk about our recommendations if you are interested in this space. Please note, we are not financial or legal professionals or real crypto heads at all. (laughs) This is not financial or legal advice. This is just a discussion amongst enthusiastic authors learning along the way. You can check out the show notes with lots of links for episode 601 on the blog and also links at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. We'd love to know what you think. So leave a comment on the show notes or on the YouTube channel, or you can tweet me at thecreativepen with a double N or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. We'd especially love to hear from you if you have resources or thoughts on the financial and tax implications of NFTs. I'm also heavily researching DAOs, which we'll talk about, (laughs) uh, and also generative art. So let me know if that's your area of interest or expertise. You can find more futurist podcast episodes, articles and resources at thecreativepen.com forward slash future. Thanks to my patrons at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen, whose financial support enables me to do these extra in between episodes. If you find this useful, please consider supporting the show at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen or for a one off tip, you can use buymeacoffee.com forward slash the creative pen. Okay, let's get into the discussion on the possibilities of NFTs for authors. Jay Thorne is a best-selling horror and dark fantasy writer, and he also writes non-fiction for authors. He's a podcaster at Writers Inc. and the Author Success Mastermind, as well as an editor. Jay and I have co-written several books together, including American Demon Hunter's Sacrifice, the inaugural Authors on a Train event with Zach Bohannon and Lindsay Baroka. 
Now, today we're talking about NFTs and in particular, what we want to see in a platform for NFT books that will help authors sell more books, make more money, provide value to readers and build community. So welcome back to the show, Jay. Thanks, Joanna. Excited to be back. <laughs> I'm excited to talk to you. So you and I talk about this topic offline, <laughs> away yes, from the mic. I mean, amazingly, <laughs> we actually have conversations away from a microphone. <laughs> 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 People might not believe it, but we do. So let's start with the basics. How do you explain NFTs to a non-technical audience? Not well, but I, but I just read something today that I think really crystallized it for me. An NFT is proof of ownership. That's all it is. It's a receipt. And I think when you frame it that way, things start to make a lot more sense. So it's not uh, necessarily a physical object. It's not necessarily even a digital object. It's proof of ownership. I think that's one good way of explaining it. I talk about it as, as like a box. <laughs> Yes. It, a box that you can put stuff in. And we'll be talking about some of the examples of the stuff you can put in the box. But the NFT is essentially like, yeah, like the receipt showing you have access to the box. And then there's all the different kinds of things we can put in a box. I guess we should also say it is programmable in some way. So when you say a receipt, I might think in my mind, just a one liner, which says I paid Jay some money and he edited my book or whatever. And that's like a one liner, whereas NFTs can contain, uh, let's just use the words smart contract, <laughs> <laughs> which make it more programmable, right? Yes. It's a immutable digital ledger that is spread across many different computers. Uh, we'll leave out the, the, the highly technical stuff, but the idea is with an NFT, from the time it's created or minted for its entire lifespan, you can track who's owned it and when by by the address of the wallet of the owner. So yes, it, it's much more detailed than a single line receipt. And it does contain the history of that particular NFT. And then I guess we have to use the term blockchain. <laughs> and But again, as we always say, you don't need to know how the internet works to use the internet. So you don't need to know all this technical stuff. It's the same with blockchain. I think what's most interesting at this point is NFTs can be on different blockchains and the different blockchains have different different facets associated with them. And I feel like some of the objections to blockchain technologies are because they have only heard of certain things like Bitcoin. So what are some of the other blockchains that you've seen that you think are more interesting? Well, I think from an author's perspective, I'm not entirely interested in, in Bitcoin simply because Bitcoin is more like stored value. It's the digital equivalent to gold. So you can hold gold and it has value and you can sell it, but people don't really use gold to pay for things. <laughs> and in, in the much the same way, they don't really use Bitcoin transactionally. So I think for me, the next big one is Ethereum or ETH. And that one is the biggest blockchain right now, as far as uh, transactions go, especially with NFTs. But there are certain other side chains and level twos. And again, don't worry about the terminology, but there are blockchains like uh, Solana and Avalanche and Polkadot and Tezos. These are all different blockchains with different currencies that are popping up and filling different niches in the blockchain world. And that's where some of them are dealing with the carbon thing. And we'll come back on the <laughs> environmental yes. topic, which I know some people just have it in their heads. So we'll come back on that one. And they also have different fees for different transactions. So all of this stuff is just evidence of a growth in a new industry. But let's also be clear on what NFTs are not. <laughs> so, <laughs> so can you talk to that? Like, what, what are some of the issues that pe people assume an NFT is something and then it turns out not to be that way? Yes. I don't know if people are familiar with what, what happened with the Dune book, but it was auctioned, I believe, at Christie's. And the intention was that a DAO was going to turn it into an NFT project. And their, their assumption, incorrectly, was that they owned copyright or that they owned the IP to create derivatives or, or to change it. And there was a, a great article on NextWeb that said that's, that would be the equivalent of saying you bought a Jar Jar Binks toy and now you have the right to make a new Star Wars movie starring Jar Jar Binks. It, it doesn't work that way. And so really, you do not own the intellectual property. You, you, you cannot create in it or on it. Um, it is, think of it more as a, as a work of art. So if you own, if you go to a gallery and you purchase a painting, you own that painting, but you don't own 
the the intellect the intellectual property. Yeah, just to put it on the book perspective, if uh, just on a really basic level, someone goes into a secondhand bookstore and they buy a secondhand copy of your book. So they own that book and they can resell that book, but they don't own the intellectual property of that book. They can't scan it, turn it into a Kindle book and upload it onto Amazon and make money from it or make a movie of it. So it's essentially exactly the same as the physical world as such. If they had bought a physical book, and then they just assumed they had this right to do stuff with it. So you also mentioned the um, DAO, which we should just explain briefly. DAO is Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And I'm thinking about it as a collective of people who come together and you can, again, programmable ways of running an organization. And uh, let's not go into that because I'm going to have a separate episode on DAOs. I think they're incredibly interesting uh, from a legal and business perspective. But for now, we're going to stick with NFTs. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so just to be very clear, we are not, um, copyright is not assumed in an NFT unless that is specified. And of course, I had someone on on the show last year who talked about the communities of authors who are trying to grant copyright within a community, a bit like the Kindle Worlds, where the author who wrote in that got got the copyright over their book within the world, but not over the whole world. Does that make sense? It certainly does. That's a good way of explaining it. Yeah. So... (laughs) So hopefully that's given a a bit of an overview and people who are new to this topic. Let's get into some more detail. So why are you so excited about NFTs and blockchain for authors? And what are some of the benefits you can see in the years ahead? Yes, this is this is crazy stuff. I, I want to say, first of all, we are not tax professionals. We are not financial advisors. I'm barely scratching the surface of, of what Web3 is. I'm an author who's really interested in this. So everything I'm going to say is is not necessarily grounded in a ton of experience or research. It's my experience so far. And what I'm really excited about at the highest level is I... Because of where I was in my life stage in the early to mid 90s, I feel like I missed out on the internet. <laughs> like the, <laughs> the internet boom, right? Like if you think about what happened between, say, 1994 and 1999, there was an explosion of Web 1 in starting to go into Web 2 with blogging and, and eventually podcasting. And I was completely tied up in my day job and my family. And I knew what was happening, but I wasn't really paying close attention to it. I wasn't participating in it. And this feels like that. And now I feel like I have the opportunity to participate. So I think on a very grand scale, I'm excited about a a once in a lifetime opportunity. I I have uh, strong suspicions and feelings that Web3, crypto, blockchain, all the stuff we're talking about is going to radically transform our lives, whether we understand the technology or not, in much the same way the internet has. Yes. And it took really, if we say that sort of 97, we all started to hear about, or those of us in our mid 40s, uh, 50s, uh, started to hear really about the internet. I mean, I didn't get an email until I think 95 you know, an email address. So, and when we're talking about web one, we're really talking about static websites where it's like, here's a nothing, you can't do anything. It was just like the yellow pages online. And web two was the more interactive internet, blogging, podcasting. I mean, what we're in now is still kind of the end stage of web two, e-commerce, that type of thing on more interactive websites, creator content posted, social media, that kind of thing. And and Web3 is what we're seeing uh, coming in with, I guess, the metaverse, blockchain, different ways of doing things which should empower the creator economy. So what specifically for authors are you excited about in terms of the, I guess, the creative or business potential of NFTs? I think you're correct in saying potential. That is the right word. So what I'm going to discuss is not necessarily something that we can start right now, although the technology is there. But what really has me excited about specifically NFTs for authors is uh, it's a paradigm shift. We are going to have the ability to sell directly to fans and readers to create communities directly without any sort of middle entity, without a marketplace. And I know we can do this this now uh, in selling direct, but I think here is the Here's the takeaway. Like if if this is all Greek to you or you don't understand what we're talking about, this is at its core where I think it's going to fundamentally change uh, the way authors sell and do business is the resale. It's resale, digital resale. 
So with the NFTs and with the way they can, you can structure a smart contract, an author can, can, can get paid on the resale of anything, including a, uh, f- whether that's a physical book or a digital book. And if you think about that, you think about like if you sell a paperback and someone who bought your paperback goes and sells it to a used bookstore and someone else comes in and buys that book from the used bookstore, you as the author receive zero from that. But imagine in perpetuity, you as the author receive 10% of that resale forever. I think that's just a radical idea that's going to completely change the way we do business. Yes. And that's why I think so many people haven't got this yet because it hasn't happened before. (laughs) (laughs) But people literally, the penny hasn't dropped because, and the publishing industry and some of the things I've seen online from agents and publishers who I, I do, well, I guess, and this is another difference, right? You and I are creators and the listeners, we create IP. We are the creator economy. And so everything we put out into the world with our name on it, that we own the IP for, we get money for some kind of licensing on that. And our it's all funded by what we actually make. Whereas people who work in the publishing industry generally get a salary that is not related to the licensing of their own IP. So I I feel like sometimes people aren't understanding this because they aren't actually creators. And this I'm very excited about the same reason as you, because resale opens up for the life of copyright. Okay, this is what's so exciting with a programmable smart contract. So I create something now like an NFT, which may or may not, like, uh, someone's going to buy one of my N- NFTs or yours because they're supporting us and <laughs> it's a bit of a gimmick right now. Right. But let's say they buy it for, let's say, 250 US dollars. And, that you know, that's nice. But what then happens is they can resell that over time and I get a percentage of that resale. So I could get, they could sell it next year and maybe because I'm such a prolific creator, (laughs) the value has gone up. So maybe it's now worth $400 and I get 10% of that. So I get like 40 bucks just turns up in my wallet. And then I do something and I manage to hit some list or I win an award and suddenly the value of my IP is worth more. So so my trading value on my NFTs goes up too. And maybe I, I've created more limited editions of things. And so the value of my intellectual property suddenly just expands into this incredible realm. That's why I'm excited. Yes. It's funny you use that example of uh, winning awards or having a breakout hit where I was thinking like, I'll probably say something stupid or get arrested and that'll make the value <laughs> of mine go up. <laughs> yeah, but there is that. You just don't know. I mean, the funny thing is I really feel like right now, this is fiction, particularly the fiction business model right now, I feel is almost broken because the rise of subscription models for eBooks and digital audio are tending the income for fiction digital products down. It's, it's sloping down. And so, yes, sure. There's print on demand, but many indies make far more with digital products for fiction in particular. Um, This doesn't count with nonfiction because nonfiction is I think far more resilient. And then you've got ads, the fact that we have to pay for ads. So I've I've been feeling for a while, like frustrated that our business model just can't last another decade. But this to me feels like the pivot. It feels like with special editions, let's call them special digital editions, NFTs, we are suddenly going to explode the fiction possibilities and the fiction business model, Uh, even with collaboration, like you and I, right? We still have to fanny around with (laughs) paying each other for various projects (laughs) you know whereas if we had smart contracts the money just arrives in your account in your wallet automatically so it opens up the potential for collaboration and so much more i totally agree and i think this is probably going to bridge into the conversation around nfts in the nonfiction space but i think there are some opportunities in fiction that are that can build upon habits and behaviors we already have and leverage the power of the technology. So here's a very rudimentary example. Let's say that you as a fiction author offer a book club to your core readers. And let's say you and 20 readers are going to get together and you're going to, you're going to hold a book club meeting. And those people are coming to that because they're drawn to you. They want to support you. So imagine now that this, you sell an NFT that is your seat in this book club. And now you own that seat. And as time goes on, if you want to sell it to someone else, you can. 
And, and, and as you mentioned, if your stock as an author goes up or if you become more in demand or your time is more limited, the perceived value on that book club seat grows as well. So it's just one small example of the way I think the NFTs have the potential to really change the way fiction authors sell and market too. Mm, well, let's get into that question then. So if the NFT unlocks a digital box of things, <laughs> let's talk about those different things. So you just mentioned their access to a book club. Talk about that in your idea for nonfiction based community and masterminds. Yes. So I am currently in a what I'm calling an NFT beta phase where I have a small uh, subset of people within my author community who wrote, they raised their hand and said they want to be part of this. And so we're, we don't have it all figured out yet, but we're in, in the middle of figuring out, okay, how can we create this subgroup, this smaller group that has access? One of the problems with NFTs right now is that the lingo and the tech bros who are talking about this stuff are, are using language that sort of excludes the average person because they, they feel stupid, like they don't know what they're talking about, which that's always bothered me with technology and it's still here. But you know what? it's not that complicated. And having the ability to create access is different than buying a JPEG. So if you look at the, the news stories, all the news stories around, you know, someone paid $69 million for this JPEG. Why would they do that? And a JPEG is one type of NFT. Uh, it's probably the most popular one. But as you mentioned, if you think about it more as a digital box, you can put anything in there. Like Gary Vaynerchuk's doing really in innovative stuff with his NFTs that includes access to him, attendance at physical live events, and more. So the sky's the limit here as far as what you can put into that digital box. Yes. Yeah, so I guess what you're talking about there is the idea of a community coin, which you and I are in some other uh, kind of futurist communities around this. And if you buy one of these tokens or an NFT that can represent a ticket to something, then it get, gives you access. And I was talking to a friend of mine who is a coach and he was kind of struggling to understand this potential for his business model. And I was telling him about the NFT smart contract doesn't have to be for the life of copyright. It doesn't have to be a product. We'll circle back to products in a minute. It can be a service, like you're yes. saying. It could be access to a community. And I said to him, well, it could be access to, say, six months coaching. So someone buys the token up front. But then I said, what is awesome is this functionality called airdropping, right? So you airdrop yes. to anyone holding a token of yours like extra special things. So maybe you've done a special audio that goes out to everyone holding your token, or maybe you've commissioned some art to go with your project, or maybe you just do something special, which you can then airdrop to anyone holding one of your tokens. And we were talking about the benefits for your long-term kind of client maintenance of being able to surprise his uh, awesome extra for you, or, you know, a lesson on something, if it's nonfiction or if it's fiction, a, a bonus chapter or something. And then and it arrives on people's in people's wallet. And it almost, I don't want to say it replaces email, but it becomes this way to deliver surprising, delightful things to an audience who have already invested in you. Absolutely. And it it, as you mentioned, it doesn't have to be something that lasts forever. You could almost think of an NFT as an enhanced concert ticket. So let's say a, and a musician wants to put on a show and much like on a Patreon or Kickstarter, they create several tiers of access. And if you purchase the NFT for whatever level of access you want, and once you've purchased that NFT, everything else is, is controlled by the program. So you could scan the NFT, you could sell it to someone else, you could trade it. The NFT knows where you're supposed to be and where you're not. And especially in a digital world, I can fully imagine NFTs or tokens of some kind replacing membership software. If the your your membership site can read the address in your wallet and knows you belong there, you're just in. You don't have to you don't need a password. You don't need to register. It's it's all automated. And and I think there's a lot of potential there too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of the other things you might do. So you're obviously incredibly great at communities. That's one of your superpowers. <laughs> and it's not one of mine. 
<laughs> and so I am far more interested in the, I think, you know, my dad's a visual artist. He was a sculptor and now he's a printmaker and my brother's a photographer and we come from more of a visual arts family. And I am also starting to create art around my worlds with AI generation tools, which is a whole nother podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like for me, I the business model I'm interested in is what I mentioned before, which is creating NFTs of limited digital editions. So for example, with the short story I just put out, Blood, Sweat and Flame, which is set in the glass blowing world. That's just a short story, right? But the ideas I have for the NFTs I could do around that short story just open the world up to other things. So collaboration with an artist or making my own art, for example, or creating a postscript on the story of what happened next or collaborating with a glass artist to do a video. Or There's lots of things I can do to make a limited edition um, version of these books. Now, in my mind, these are all individually different. So I only see myself doing like three or five or maybe even 10 individual NFTs for each book and that would be like a collection so the collection would be per book and each one would be different so even like super fans might buy more than one because they love whatever it is that I've included and then over time my collections will grow and grow around my already the IP that I have in my universes and to me <laughs> this is making me feel so much more creative because I've got so many ideas that suddenly become viable within this space and I know lots of fiction authors who've already commissioned art and things like this that they could include in in NFT so do you have any thoughts on on product oh I wish I had more hours in the day Joanna <laughs> because <laughs> I, I'm like you I, I can honestly say that the, the whole NFT craze of 2021 was the sole reason I started picking up my guitar again I, I hadn't had taken my guitar out of its case for years and I started to see what was happening. And I thought, wow, music is another great place. So you mentioned the graphic arts, which is clearly a, a wonderful opportunity. And same with the visual and the auditory arts. I think if you're a musician and you have the ability to create original music, you could tie that to your fiction, to, to different stories. And I'm actively working on writing some music now that I think will tie into several things that I'm working on. And I don't need a a major record label. I don't need to go through Spotify. Th these are things that my audience might be interested in and I can sell it directly to them. So uh, I I agree with you. I, I'm so excited. It's really restoked a lot of my creative fire outside of just the writing and publishing. Oh, awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. I hope people listening can hear our excitement. And I do feel like like we're pretty, let's say, mature <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in the indie space. <laughs> We've been around the block a few times in the indie world. And I think you do become a little bit sort of, yes, I, I know how to write a book now. I know how to sell a book. Uh, I know how to market a book and I'll just do it again. And yes, every book is interesting in its way, but there's so much more that we want to do with the ideas. And this, this finally gives us a chance to do it. So I do want to ask about another example, which uh, you forwarded to me earlier about royalty rights to songs. Now, this could also apply to books. So talk about this. This is fascinating. Uh, and I, I'm not surprised it's happening in the music industry because artists in that industry have been exploited for a long time. And I think they see uh, Web 3.0 as an opportunity to, to gain back some of their rights and their IP and, and their revenue, quite frankly. Uh, Nas, a big time rapper, uh, is selling royalty rights to two of his songs. And this is on a, a platform called Royal.io. And uh, it's brand new. So there's not much here yet. But just to give you a sense of what's possible, he has uh, he's creating tokens around one song. He created three levels, a gold, a platinum, and a diamond. At the gold level, which is uh, $50, so you pay $50 and you get access to his Discord and you get some sort of, uh, he calls it a sweet chick secret menu. I don't know what that is, but it must be valuable. <laughs> Sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you also get 0.0143% uh, ownership of his streaming royalties on that song. So when that song is played, you're going to share in that revenue. On, on the platinum level, it's $250 to buy in. You get everything with gold, plus you get exclusive merch. And in that, you get 0.0857% of streaming royalties. 
And then the top tier, the diamond, you get everything for gold and platinum. You also get two VIP concert tickets, exclusive signed vinyl, a video conversation with him, and 2.14% of streaming royalties. And that package costs $5,000. So you can already see mm. how artists are empowering not, they're not only empowering their audience, they're bringing them along. And I think this is, again, one of those fundamental differences. You're not only supporting the artist, but you are benefiting from their success. Everybody wins in this situation. There's a few things out of this. So first of all, you've got baked in marketing for everyone who buys a token <laughs> because everyone is incentivized <laughs> to yes. go um, a stream NAS on whatever platform. And of course, as we know, if you send traffic and get more people streaming, the algorithms like it and they bump you up. So if you get all those token holders streaming and telling their friends, hey, will you stream NAS this weekend at your party or whatever, um, you get baked in marketing, which is brilliant. Secondly, this is called, I believe is called fractional fractionalization where you're yes. essentially splitting this into micro payments and this is exactly what we need in the publishing space yes. and just for something that people ask me all the time I get so many emails and this I wanted to do this too with my first book which is I want to give 10% of my profits to charity how do I do that this is one of those ways you could in your smart contract have a 10% fraction that goes directly to a charity's digital wallet if they set one up. That's another way of looking at it. But I think that's amazing. I also love the so Royal, which the CEO is Blau. I think you pronounce his name Blau, 3LAU. I, he is the one who got me into this about a year ago. I heard him speak at a conference, did online, obviously, pandemic. <laughs> and when he spoke, I saw our future because he's a creator. He is an artist. Yes. And he's not well known as far as I know in the normal world, but he just ran with blockchain early and the dude is just doing so well. And obviously now what he started, Royal, and this is probably going to be billions of dollars for him now because he's he's done the architecture for other musicians. <laughs> so yeah, that's amazing, right? It is. And it's very easy to just say, okay, substitute novel for song, mm. <laughs> right? Like you, we can take the same structure. And this is what I'm working on right now is I want to be able to fractionalize the royalties for my books. And I want to be able to give a half a percent or 1% to, to, to hundreds, you know, well, not hundreds, I can't do the math there, but I, I want to be able to fractionalize and give percentages or parts of percentages of royalties to readers because now they're incentivized to, as you said, market the book and everybody wins. When the book sells, I make money and they make money and it, it works all the way around. So the fact that this structure is already in place, that there are artists, creatives who are doing this, uh, it's just a matter of time before it comes to us. And I can't wait for it. I agree. And this is another kind of principle of Web3, right? So you're rewarded for participation, in a community. Yes. So whereas like at the moment you're on Twitter and I like, oh, you know, Jay's my friend. I really want to support him. I'll tweet here about his book or whatever. And then that's helping in a way. In the future, we'll be able to help each other or support the creators we love by buying tokens. We support them. We also get a cut. <laughs> 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 so that's really amazing. There are now social networks on blockchain where you get rewarded for participation and, and you get coins for what your participation is. There is obviously gaming, play to earn, I think it's called, where you can play games on blockchain and earn coin. And there are people making full-time livings from this. So <laughs> this is not future anymore, is it? It's kind of right now. No, no, it's not. And I'm not a gamer. So I don't know the world, but I do know that... Uh, that NFTs and, and tokenization of gaming is is probably what's going to be the gasoline on the fire here. Once the big companies get behind this, or once there are some indies who start understanding how blockchain works, uh, because this is the kind of thing that's been happening with uh, traditional currency for years. I mean, kids would, or, you know, in Roblox or Minecraft or whatever you, you know want to call it, they're going in, they're buying digital weapons and digital outfits. And this is already happening. So there's no stopping it. 
Yes, and we should say you mentioned they're big companies. I mean, uh, Microsoft just bought a massive gaming company, which you guys covered on the Writers Inc., which was great. But also, I've seen news articles that YouTube's looking at NFTs. Twitter obviously is looking at it. Meta, <laughs> Facebook yeah. slash Meta is looking at NFTs. And when these big companies are, are looking at it, that's when it will go more mainstream. I mean, let's just be clear: I have not bought. An NFT. I <laughs> I am excited as a creator. Uh, there is a creator I really love, but his work has already like blown up massively. But you d- you have bought one. Tell us about that. Yeah. Yes. I I've purchased a few, but the one I'm I'm really excited about is uh, it's called Ziggurat, and the Ziggurat was created by Mike Shinoda of Lincoln Park, and it's a he calls it a generative mixtape. So what he did is he created, I think it was 8,000 or 9,000 NFTs. And what he did was uh, they're a combination of a profile picture style graphic and music. And he created different characteristics, different variables. So everything from hair color to eye color to facial expressions. On the music track, there were 10 or, or 15 different drum beats different melodies, different instrumentation. So he created all of these sort of core building blocks, so to speak, of these, of both the the graphic image and the audio. And then he fed that into an AI and the AI then kicked out 8,000 unique NFTs. So no two are the same. Now they might share certain attributes, but every single one of those is unique. And when I heard about this, I just thought that sounds like the coolest thing ever. And I went and and on the day it dropped, it, it sold out instantly. It's on the Tezos blockchain. So I ended up buying one off the secondary market. It, it was already, I think it, the original minting, like it was the equivalent of about 75 US dollars. And when I bought it, it was maybe 110. So it cost me a little bit more, but I have one now and it's so creative and it's so unique and I thought, if, I need, if I'm going to get into the space, I need to know what it feels like to be a fan, to be a consumer. And so I kind of got that experience. And it's just, it was really fun. And I've, I've, people are tired of hearing me talk about it because I share it everywhere. But it was just a really, it was a great example of being super creative and using the technology in a way that hadn't been done before. Oh, and it's funny because you talked about it. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I used to li- listen to Linkin Park back in the day, put them <laughs> on the Spotify playlist and <laughs> revisiting like 90s when I used to listen to these things. And um, so I think it's really interesting. And what you've done there is you're a fan of the music. You know that creator. I mean, he has name recognition amongst certain people, obviously, but you're a fan. So that's a great example. I also, that generative mixtape idea, I actually did a one hour tutorial on how to do that at the weekend I'll link to it in the show notes and it was for the visual ones so and I mean I'm not a programmer <laughs> but this guy really kind of took it from if even if you don't know programming you can do this and this is as kind of a sub question though because I've been into AI generative work for a while now and words as well as images and you're talking about music there but you were not that much of a fan of AI art generation (laughs) um, a year ago so has that changed? No it hasn't I knew you were going to put me on the spot on this I was prepared (laughs) Uh, this might be semantics and and maybe I just need to get over myself but I think that the difference here is that Mike didn't use AI to create the components he used it to assemble them yeah, so, that is no, that, but that's what I do. I assemble, I put the input in and I assemble what comes out. So, yeah, I think it is semantics. And, but I, I think, have you tried AI generative music? I have not. Okay. Have you tried AI generative anything? Yes, I tried the text. AI okay, yeah, but not text. the text. Because what I think is important, people listening to, so for example, the, um, it's been going around in the art space, the Wombo Dream app. Like Rachel put some of her pictures up. Rachel Heron put some oh, of her yes, pictures up. Yes, so yeah, right. Wombo Dream. So everyone listening, W-O-M-B-O, Wombo Dream. Get the app or get it on your desktop. And what I'm doing with that is I'm putting in, I'm creating like word clouds separately of my novels. And then you create images with AI from a string of words. So you enter the words and then it outputs a unique image based on your words. So your words will always be different to my words. And it creates a, essentially they're going to have a minting button soon. (laughs) 
<laughs> but I love this idea that I can take my words and turn them into visual art. And in the same way, there's obviously now AI generative music, which is another art form. So, I mean, this is a sub a subtopic. We're going to come back on this subtopic, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but to create for an, um, uh, that's just on a practical level for someone to create 9,000, 10,000 individual NFTs, <laughs> you have to have some help. Yes. Um, that is because I'm, I said before I do three or five or 10, because I'm going to individually make them, which is different. I can assemble those separately. I don't need an AI to help me create them. So I think people have to consider what kind of collections they want to do, what kind of audience they're looking for. I mean, you wouldn't do 10,000 community tokens, would you, I guess? No, no. And I mean, even going back to Royal, like, there were only, uh, I think there were only a total of 750 tokens, 760 tokens total. So yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a, a CryptoPunks or a, a massive collection. Uh, you can make one of, one of ones. And I think that's more of what you're talking about. Yes. And I think, again, that's because I guess what I've seen my dad do. And it's so funny. And one of my kind of phrases for this year is more digital, more physical. So as in, I want to get more into all this digital stuff, but I also want to do more physical stuff. So I did a book binding course years ago, but I'm going on another one. So I'm actually, I want to make physical products too. I want to make limited edition physical products. And then on my JF Pen redesigned website, which I'm going to do this year, it will have limited editions as a page. And on that page, it will have limited physical editions and limited NFT editions. And that's how I want to educate people. I love that. And I, I'm thinking along the same lines with music and thinking of doing the, the digital files, obviously, but maybe a limited press vinyl or a, mm. a limited number of CDs. And, and so in the physical world, as well as in the digital world. There you go. And I hope that that kind of crosses the gap, doesn't it? These are it limited editions, but equally with those physical products, once they're sold, they're gone. Right. <laughs> 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 they are gone <laughs> so you're never going to get any more money for that but I just like the idea I think I think that's cool okay anything else on any ideas we have so look and we're just this is just off the top of our heads and we haven't even started yet I mean you can put video in you can do audio obviously you can I'm going to do scans of my hand edits I love the partnership idea with other artists uh, I mean even like you and I could uh, in in the past we've obviously done written products but we can do you can do an NFT for an audio only product, like a private conversation between Joanna Penn and Jay Thorne. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of things you can do that people will be interested in if they're in your community, I guess. Absolutely. And as we said with the, the whole smart contract thing, it doesn't require us uh, finagling around and doing all the accounting. Like we, in the smart contract, we put ourselves as co-creators and our percentages. And then anytime that sells, it just ends up in our wallet. Yeah. So I guess both of us are, I mean, you're more heavily into the music space. I'm more, probably more heavily into the art space, but we're watching these communities who are ahead of us. Like they're ahead of publishing as a music and music's always like two to five years ahead. Would you say? It feels that way. Yeah. So I would say we've probably got at least another year before we get a pl Well, let's talk about platforms. Okay. So everyone's now really excited if they haven't turned off. <laughs> <laughs> the people who are here are loving it though. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, tell us more. Tell us more. How can I do one? Okay. So hold up, hold your horses. Okay. We're recording this on the 26th of January, 2022. Everything we are saying, we're going to probably do the, another one of these in a couple of months, right? <laughs> <laughs> It'll all change. <laughs> it will all change. But the principle should remain. So there are different companies emerging with different business models for NFTs in publishing. And I do see some early adopters jumping in. I've had some people on my podcast like Creatokia. I've got some meetings with some other people. You've had some meetings with some other people. I, I'm not even going to list them all because there's already like 10 on my list already. But what are your thoughts on any companies you want to mention and anything that you've seen is particularly interesting? The one I want to mention, and I'll, I'll be fully transparent and say that I'm a moderator on their Discord server. So I, I, I don't, I'm not getting compensated monetarily, but I'm definitely interested in what they're doing is bookcoin.com. But out of all of the NFT book sites that are popping up, I'm most intrigued by bookcoin. Um, and for a number of reasons, if, if you go to bookcoin.com, I think their messaging is crystal clear and they're, they're trying to carve out a market. And right now, what they're 
their value proposition is own a quote, a character, or a chapter from your favorite book. And their first drop is going to be next month in February of 2022. And it's going to be Mark Manson's book and uh, a New York Times bestseller. So I think... Uh, we should say coin- that is the subtle art of not giving a F. Yes. I wasn't uh, going to say the title. K. <laughs> Yeah, that one, which which I'm sure everyone's heard of. It was one of the first to use that language in a book title and then everyone did it. (laughs) Yes, yes. And it is, it was massive and is massively successful. Mark Manson just finished working with Will Smith on a memoir. But anyways, the the Bookcoin guys, they have Alan Watts, uh, an Alan Watts collection coming up after the Mark Manson drop. I don't know who that is either. Yeah, he's a sort of 20th century philosopher type, I guess would be the best way to describe them. But I think what Bitcoin is doing is they're starting with name recognition. They're starting with authors that everyone knows as a way to bridge that gap. And, and I think that's an approach I really like because and, until they have a platform that's mature and developed and that readers feel comfortable going to, indies, self-publishers have no hope of getting any discoverability. So I really, I, I'm really interested in Bitcoin, and as I said, I'm working for them as a moderator because I really believe in what they're doing. And that first drop comes next month, so I think things are going to start rolling pretty fast there. Okay, that's interesting. Now, Korea Tokyo, who I had on on the podcast, I've been talking to them about things, and they're working with a lot of the publishing uh, industry. They're a German company, and they're very well known for their work in already digital work with audio and ebooks within Europe. So they, what's interesting about Korea Tokyo, I guess, is because their company is Bookwire, they have a reputation. They're also German and the EU rules around around crypto, around finances, around tax. I mean, the EU has a lot more stringent stuff. So why I'm interested in, in them is because I feel like they're going to do it in the right way. <laughs> because this is something like, and again, we can't get into it because we don't know ourselves. Like, what are the financial implications? What are these for tax? Are they a product? Are they a service? Are they an asset? How does the tax work on the first sale? How does it work on the resale? There's things we don't know yet, which is why I'm kind of holding off. So, Creatoki is definitely looking at all these things. I, I also had a book chain on last year, Simon Pierre. They're out of Canada. They're on the Ethereum blockchain and they're looking more at the infrastructure side, as in not really a marketplace. And then there's some other ones that we're both looking at. I'll put a list in the show notes for this episode of the companies that I know about right now. And over time, there are going to be more of them. I think why we're waiting, I mean, we're waiting for one because there's no specific company that we're that's ready. But also I feel like to me, When I upload an NFT and I'm essentially creating a smart contract, that could last for a very long time. So it has to be right. It has to be automated. I have to know what it means. You know, this is like signing a contract for the life of copyright, if that's your, um, you know, if you haven't term limited your NFT. So that's why I have some hesitation. What what about you? Uh same. I had intended on on minting the an NFT by now, but the platforms just aren't ready yet. And and like you said, there's just too many un- unanswered questions. I I have one friend who has a, a marketplace on the Solana blockchain, and I I had a great conversation with him. But there's even he still isn't sure about about a lot of this. I think this goes back to I, I'm I'm making a broad generalization here, but it'll make a point. You mentioned earlier that. We are much more interested as creators because we're the ones creating the IP. Mm. I feel like some of the people who are building the marketplaces or uh, building the infrastructure, they don't see that same risk because they're not putting their IP out there. Yeah. <laughs> they are, they're getting paid to build it. And so there's this sort of, uh, in some of these conversations I've had, there's this sort of, oh yeah, we'll figure that out. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, we need to figure that out first. Like you, we can't just put stuff up there and figure it out later. But again, if you're not risking your own IP, then then I can see why they have that perspective. So I think that's a, a, a general thing that's, that's causing me some hesitation um, across the board right now. 
Yeah, you're exactly right. It, it has to be a creator. I mean, that's why I love what Blau's doing with, with Royal, because he's the guy who already, and, and I know because like, when I heard him speak, he'd like programmed all this stuff for his own website around being able to mint directly from his website. And like he'd, he's put in the years of doing this as a creator. And he knows like with this fractionalization for Nas, he knows that's what the musicians want yes. <laughs> and so, because that's what he wants and as the creator. So yeah. And this is the discussion I, I've also had with people. It's look, look, this is me. You're essentially taking a piece of me <laughs> and you're just going to say, Oh yeah, yeah. We'll figure that out later. It's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I value my IP way more. So as of January, February, 22, we don't feel like there's probably a, a, a site that's got everything we need, but equally don't sign a contract that, that essentially gives a publisher all formats existing now or to be created for the life of copyright. No, I would, I would not agree to any of those clauses. <laughs> <laughs> no, because basically what we're talking about is essentially a new format. It's a digital limited edition or a special edition. I reckon publishers will fight over eBooks, the definition of eBooks as well, but definitely don't sign a clause that means you can't do this because it's really not clear how it's, it's going to shake out. So what else do we want when it comes to an NFT platform for books? There's another angle to this that I think is, is being overlooked right now. And that is the reader experience or the collector experience. Rightfully so, most of these marketplaces, that, even the ones we're talking about, they're focusing on people who are into crypto and people who are NFT collectors. But that's not how, the main, that's not how you're going to get the mainstream over there. And, and the fact that the default community tool is Discord is is problematic in my opinion, and I told that to the Bitcoin guys. I said, "Hey, you know, Discord is great if you want to gather NFT collectors, but your average author and reader have no idea what Discord is, and, and so that's a barrier right there." So I think there's a lack of focus on what the experience is for a reader as opposed to an NFT collector, because I think those are two different archetypes. Yeah, I totally agree. And in fact, you and I have even talked about: um, Do we need? an NFT for book marketplace, as in, could we just use a marketplace that's designed for something else? But equally, like I went on OpenSea and they don't allow an EPUB. (laughs) 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 So yeah, that kind of meant that you couldn't do it with just directly like on OpenSea, which is a, a marketplace. But although what will happen is there will inevitably be multiple companies. We're not saying that one of these will turn out to be the Amazon of Web3. I mean, I'm sure they hope they will be. <laughs> but I actually think there'll be multiple marketplaces like there are for art and music and all of this type of thing. But the, because of the way blockchain is is structured and they get this sort of cross-chain development that's going on, you should be able to resell on other marketplaces anyway, right? Absolutely. And and I think too, like this, this also gets to the core of what we're talking about here. Like it, OpenSea won't allow an EPUB. I'm guessing they allow a PDF. Well, what, re, what hardcore reader wants to read a PDF? Nobody, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. they, they want the physical copy. They want the book in their hand or they want a, a file that they can sideload or put onto a device and read. Reading on a PDF is one of the worst experiences of anything. And if you don't know that and you're thinking, wow, we're going to make an NFTs and we're going to deliver PDFs, like, well, who wants those? Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So yes, so we want a marketplace that's easy to use, easy to navigate, easy to use. I also want flexibility on terms of my contract. What I've seen when I've dived into some of the terms and conditions on multiple of these sites, I've like had a look, is that they're going with a standard smart contract that we've set up already. So if you click mint, then it just executes a standard contract with one wallet. So you can only have one wallet for your whole kind of user. And a think about that as uh, like a equivalent of a PayPal account, for example. So you can only use one. Whereas to me, I want flexibility on the terms of the NFT, the duration of the NFT smart contract. And I want to be able to split between different wallets so that we can do collaboration. People are saying, oh, well, we can add that in later. But the fact is, if I create something with a smart contract, that's it. That's it's it's set on the blockchain and maybe that's 20 years or something or life of copyright like that that sets it in stone and therefore like any other contract it means i can't use that again (laughs) 
Exactly. Exactly. And that's why we're saying like, we need some of this figured out now. It's, it's not a, it's not a way we'll figure it out later. I, I agree though. I like, and, and I think too, it's important to recognize that the whole thing with Web3 is it's decentralized. I don't think there's going to be a single website like an Amazon for book NFTs. I think there are going to be dozens and they might splinter according to genre. They could splinter according to style. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm totally guessing, but I, I don't think there will be just one, which makes it all the more important to have some of that cross-chain operability because otherwise what you get, what you don't want to get into is a situation where if i use a physical a real world example like i'm only selling this nft in france and you can only pay with it with a euro and and that's it like if you want to buy this product in england you can't because it's only available in france and that's the analogy i think of with these different blockchains if there's not some sort of omni chain or, or way to transact across them Yes. And I guess we should say is that we're really moving into a point where the smart people who are into this stuff are building the architecture of what this will turn into. So I almost feel like we are, we're saying like what we want and I absolutely expect it will come. I remember like years ago, I remember when the Kindle first came out in America and I was like, hey, I want that. Excuse me. I'm, I'm in Australia. I want that. Can I have that, please? And they're like, uh, no, we're not doing that. And then they opened up the KDP to Americans. <laughs> and again, I'm like, hey, uh, can I have that? And then for years, we didn't have pre-orders. Do you remember? We didn't yes. have pre-orders for maybe six years of my indie career. And I was like, I just want pre-orders. Please let us have pre-orders. What is the big deal with this? And then eventually we got pre-orders. And like all these things do happen. It's just a matter of when they happen. So I think we're saying we're not going to wait forever until everything's sorted out, but I'm not doing a drop until at least the financial, like, is it a product or is it an asset? This is kind of a basic, <laughs> basic question. Right. Like I need to be able to answer to my accountant you know, yes. come tax time. So <laughs> yeah. those are some core questions that need to be answered. And I'm a bit baffled because I'm like, doesn't somebody know? Like there are literally trillions of dollars being exchanged in mm. crypto like doesn't somebody know like what about <laughs> yeah. the, you know these whales that are buying millions of dollars worth of of nfts like are they paying sales tax or who is the, the, like the, well and the, it is very complicated i was actually reading an article in the financial times today about switzerland because people are like oh it'll never go mainstream and i'm like yeah switzerland's like the banking capital of the world and switzerland's a real crypto hub and they're looking at all these questions so i think that this is it's either going to be regulated or banned per market right so i think we're going to see this by jurisdiction but of course <laughs> the kind of amusing thing about it is it, this is how do you even know what jurisdiction you have to pay tax in what some jurisdiction right. <laughs> but you don't know where the wallet holder is and your wallet is could be you know who knows where it is so i do both of us we understand the problems with this but equally I think we're just we're seeing this in a long term perspective, right? We're seeing this as the next I'm seeing it really as the next 30 plus years of my career, like the fundamentals of what it, it will underpin my business model. <laughs> yeah, it, it, whether whether you I mean, there might be some people who are plugging their ears right now and don't want to hear this, but this is going to be our business for the coming decades like this is it's going to operate on on this basic technological infrastructure, whether you like it or not. And I think it, we're all in a, going to be in a better situation if we're thinking about and learning about this stuff now, as opposed to putting our heads in the sand and pretending like it's not coming. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of things you've mentioned, Discord server. Now, I just hate that phrase even. It's just terrible. I mean, it just, the word server is in just incredibly technical, whereas actually it's like, it's not like a server it's like a chat room, isn't it? Really? It's like a, it's like a Slack group, in that there are different channels. I hate Discord. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I hate it. I'm only in them because these are the that's where these communities are existing for the people in this space right now. And that, again, like I I'm, I don't want to belabor the point, but like your your typical average author or reader doesn't even know what Discord is. And it's just, it's a terrible yeah. place to build a community. And not even that. It's like, I didn't join the Discord thing until really only the last six weeks, even though I'd already bought some tokens because I was like, I do not need another thing in my life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have another thing to check. Like I really don't. Right. So, and I think this is what people feel, even if 
they don't mind the technical side. They're like, I don't want something else. And so, yeah, I think that's interesting. I will give a shout out to Cryptoversal, um, Cryptoversal Books, and I'll link in the show notes. They have a Facebook group for Cryptoversal. Now they're a new platform. They're, you know, looking at what they want to do, but kudos to them for starting a Facebook group and inviting discussion and sharing things and answering questions. So I'm going to link to that in the notes because I'm in that group and I'm actually enjoying it more than the discords because I feel like I know how to use a Facebook group. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas the discord, I go in and it's like, oh, oh, I just don't like it. So I think you're right. I think that's going to be difficult. Right. I do want us to address um, the question of why are people still so overwhelmingly negative about NFTs <laughs> and blockchain? <laughs> so what, what are some of the resistances that you're seeing in your community and anything we can do about it? From my perspective, I think it's just good old fashioned fear. I, like, I don't think it's more complicated than that. You know, it's all of, people don't understand the terminology. They don't necessarily understand the technology. I still don't understand how <laughs> cryptocurrency works and like writing to the block and proof of stake. Like I, I don't get all that either. But there's a legitimate and and valid concern that like I don't understand this and that in two clicks of a button I could end up losing all this money. The media uplays stories about people who lost their seed phrase for their wallet or so, such and such got hacked and stole X number of Bitcoin. Like it's no different than what happens in, in fiat in, in the regular banking world and online, but like it's scary stuff. And I think until there are some places where this is this web three infrastructure is invisible and people are just on it, sort of like PayPal. Like do you remember, I don't know if you remember when online banking was first becoming a thing. Again, this would have, would have been early to mid two thousands. Uh, I can all the same arguments were there. Someone's going to break into my account. They're going to take all my money. I'm not ever buying anything online. Someone will steal my credit card number. And and, and now look, now we all transact online without giving it a second thought. So I think we're eventually going to get there. But it's those same basic fears that I'm hearing now that I heard twenty years ago. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also think, uh, I mean, the people who are the big companies, who are the gatekeepers, the controllers, going back to Royal again, I imagine people are not that happy that Royal's happening because if musicians just go straight to Royal and, you know, essentially your crowdfunding and sharing in your royalties, I mean, that cuts out (laughs) a heck of a lot of people in the supply chain of music to fans. And the same will happen with books. And obviously we've seen one stage of that with independent publishing, but we still see the misinformation that we see about indie and, you know, listeners, I'm sure you've seen the misinformation. I still get it all the time. Like, oh, all self-published books are just crap. They're all really terrible and low quality. I mean, you, we still get this stuff after, what, 15 years? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but you know what? That's the story you want to believe then that's fine. You don't have to do anything about it. And I feel like this area, if you spend a bit of time delving a bit deeper into it, and we, as we talked about, hopefully we'll have another conversation in a couple of months or something, and we'll just keep talking about this and hopefully be able to shed some light on it. Uh, Oh, we do. Wait, we we have to come back to the environmental concerns because I promised that before. So people always say, oh, but it's destroying the planet. So what's your answer? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> then stop using email <laughs> because email uses way more resources than crypto does. Uh, that, that's a bit of a flippant answer. And I don't mean to be facetious with it, but in, in all honesty, yes, there are concerns about environmental impacts. They're, they are real. Uh, that is mostly on uh, Ethereum. There are uh, many, many smart people working hard to To fix that, we have some blockchains like Solana and Tezos and Avalanche that have very low gas fees, if any. So I I think that is a problem that will go away and it shouldn't be something that keeps you from learning about it now. As I said, if you take a look at, you you could take any slice of modern living and you could find (laughs) an egregious environmental impact from anything, whether from online streaming to email to social media, if you tallied up the environmental impact from all of those, I think they would be far greater than crypto. 
Yeah. And as you said, there are new blockchains that are have a different structure that takes less energy. But also Ethereum is looking to redesign itself to have less of a carbon footprint. So I think it, people are definitely trying to solve all of the problems of environmental impact, not just with um, blockchain, but with everything else that we do. If you just do some Googling around environmental concerns and blockchain, you're going to find lots of detailed information about how that's going to change. So yeah. Okay. If listeners want to take any action from this, what do you advise? (laughs) (laughs) If the the minimal action I would advise would be to click on some of the links in your show notes and just start taking a look at some of these websites and marketplaces and just reading them over, looking at what's on there and getting familiar with what they are and what they're offering. And if you want to go one baby step further, maybe it's not a baby step, but purchase an NFT. I, I think that like you will learn so much about what they are and the perceived value and communities that can go along with them if if you buy one. So if you have any intention of of creating your own NFT, then buying one would definitely be a smart thing to do. Yeah. Or even you could just on social media, have a look at some hashtags. Like on Instagram, I follow hash doc NFT. Uh, obviously, I would be doing that. And just some amazing art being created. And I mean, yes, that's visual art, but Instagram is a visual art kind of platform. But it just and then what you can do is click through to creator websites and see what people are doing. And again, we're creators. We create intellectual property and we license that and we please readers with it but we also make a living and we have a business so i yeah both of us see this as the next phase really the next phase in what is a very very exciting time and i guess circling right back to when we talked about is this like 1997 all over again well the internet didn't become the e-commerce and everything we do in 1997. It wasn't even in 2007. I think 2007 when the iPhone launched and when the Kindle launched. And it took at least another five years. So 2012, definitely things were starting to kick off. That's really when the early ebook stuff was happening. 2014, podcasting started to make a ton of money. And I obviously started in 2009. I feel like these things sometimes take a decade. But remember, this isn't year one of blockchain. Jay and I, surprisingly, are not on the (laughs) forefront of blockchain. No, no. (laughs) I I listened to Kevin Rowe's podcast today and and his guest was talking about the good old days of blockchain in in 2018. And I was like, wow, this is moving fast. (laughs) Well, yes. So, okay. So in um, in fact, Simon Pierre uh, from BookChain talked about this, is that his business plan was always a decade. And I think he started in 2015. So he's really seeing a sort of 2025 as when that it becomes like totally mainstream. A bit like you mentioned PayPal, like PayPal, we didn't have PayPal in 2007, right? But No, I don't think so. Well, I I don't think I did. But then by 2017, we all did stuff with PayPal and we, you and I pay each other with PayPal. (laughs) So, I mean, so this is the thing. I mean, in terms of what I think the action, same as you is listen to things, listen to podcasts. Uh, I've had a look at some of the books and they are out of date within five minutes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's one, maybe one I would recommend, but for the most part. Yeah. Which one? It's the NFT handbook, how to create, sell and buy non-fungible tokens. And it's by Matt Fortnow and Terry Q. Harrison. There was a lot of useful stuff in there because it was more about the the behavioral aspects of, of the NFT world as opposed to the technical ones. Oh, okay. No, that's great. Thank you. Right. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Yeah. Easiest thing to do is to go to theauthorlife.com. Brilliant. Thanks so much for your time, Jay. Thanks for having me back, Joanna. So I hope you found the discussion interesting and thought provoking. And we also hope you found it inspiring in some way. These technology shifts will take some years before they go mainstream. So don't worry, you don't need to do anything right now. Just have a think about what you might potentially do in a more empowered creator economy where some of these tools are available for us to use. So we'd love to know what you think. You can leave a comment on the show notes or the YouTube channel. You can tweet me at the creative pen or email me joanna at the creative pen.com. 
On Monday, back to the usual type of show, I'm talking to John Kramer about book marketing strategies that stand the test of time. John's 1000 Ways to Market Your Book was the first marketing book I ever bought. (laughs) And I've owned several of those editions over the last, gosh, 15 years. And I used to listen to his audio programs, his downloadable MP3s, before the days of podcasting really began. So it was great to connect and talk about book marketing ideas. So happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.